On the screen, see the picture uh, of this uh, young person just kind of thinking, what did I do wrong? Have you ever been misunderstood in your life? I was told as long as you're breathing, you've probably been misunderstood. Because sometimes you think, what, what, what did I say? Or I'll say to my wife, sweetheart, is there a better way I should have said this? Once in a while I'll say to her, hey, before I send this email, how about if you read it, just, you know, have another set of eyes going over that. Because in our society today, when we're not sitting there in front of somebody and we just kind of rattle out what we're thinking and then hit the send button and then it's, you know, the bombs have been released out of the cargo bay and they're, they're going to hit some, some target someplace. And so I just say, you know, just read it. Just, uh, is there, did I, is it understandable? Did, I wanted my heart to be able to say, you know, hey, I, I really love, I'm thinking about you and I, I'm just, I want to be gentle. God's word says, a soft answer turns away wrath. But how do you give a soft answer words on a, a computer screen? <laughs> they don't hear you saying, you know, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I just, it, your eyes say a lot and your, the way your voice is says so much in the communication of what's going on. And so it's, you know, you just want to be cautious there. So when I look at this little, little guy on the screen, I think in today's text, Paul is misunderstood at times. I'm wanting you to understand that sometimes when you're misunderstood, you caused it. And sometimes they misinterpreted what you said. Let me illustrate it this way. On the screen, picture of a gal looking uh, uh, through the wrong end, you know, looking at a set of binoculars at the wrong side of the binoculars if you're going to use them to bring things, something up close. So I'm having on the words, words on the screen, when you feel misunderstood, because probably 90% of the time, it's your feelings that get involved and you don't even know if they did misunderstand you but you just kind of feel misunderstood. You don't understand. I remember a few years ago when uh, my father-in-law uh, had word that he's going to have to have the valves replaced in his heart. So that goes back oh, 32 years now. And what happened is Audrey's mom came down uh, to, to be with us at our church in Indiana. And we didn't know anything was going on. And so all this was weighing on our heart. And then she said, well, how are things going to the church? And, and we were explaining, you know, some, of the, some things about the church. And, and anything else, anything else that was a pressure was just the, uh, the, the needle that, the straw that broke the camel's back, you know, the, just that little bit of weight. And she was, uh, she just kind of fell apart. We didn't know what was going on. And she said, well, and we just found out this past week, dad's going to have to have two valves replaced in his heart. And, and so she just kind of, and if we'd have known, we wouldn't, I said to Audrey, you know, I just need to not share anything, you know, about what's going on in the church with her because it's just another weight if something is going on. Just any amount is more than they can take. You've been there at times, and they they get misunderstood, or we get misunderstood. So when I look at this, when you feel misunderstood, the operative word being feel, I want you to just move away from your feelings for a moment and start thinking biblically. So let me say it this way on the screen. I'll slide that down and put these words. Maybe you should check to see if you're looking at life biblically, if you feel misunderstood. Because the issue is not whether you feel misunderstood. And if you have been misunderstood, you need to say, oh, I, I'm so, thanks for clarifying that. Thanks for sh sharing with me. That's, uh, I guess I used the wrong word there. Can I use? And then tell them what word you want to use. You don't have to worry about whether you're feeling misunderstood. If you start to think biblically, though, here's what you should think about in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. Do not be anxious about anything. I mean, we're, we have a tendency to get anxious about things. Oh, well, what if we can't pay the bills? What if this doesn't happen? What if, what if, 
What if she breaks up with me? What if... And all these kind of anxious feelings. God says, if I could put it in the vernacular, here's what God's really saying. Don't worry about it. Or God might look at you and say, relax. I've got it all under control. Don't be anxious about it. Relax. And he goes on. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You know what a petition is. Sometimes people are uh, outside, sitting outside a, a grocery store. Or, Would you sign this petition? We want to get this on the petition so that it can get before the people. And, and we say, God, here's my petition. I, I'm asking you to take care of my kids or to handle the house or to handle our health this way or do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God wants you to give you the peace. So you're not stewing about it. Oh, what if they're, what if they're upset with me? I, they misunderstood. What can I do to fix it? And then he goes on. The grand finale here. Finally, brothers, drum roll. Whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. But what do we think about? Oh, losing the house and doing this and the job problems and the health problems and the financial concerns. Who knows? He says, look, here's what I want you to be thinking about. But instead... We take the binoculars and decide to look through the wrong end. And the, the statement I want to say here is, are you looking through the wrong end of the binoculars and feeling like God and others are far from you? Because if you look through the, the small end and it brings things close to you, you turn it around and man, it looks, I can be right here and it looks like she's a long ways from me. And sometimes you feel like people are really not close to you because you're looking through the lens the wrong way and you're looking through your feelings rather than through the Word of God. Let me illustrate it this way. It's a picture of our family. This was uh, last April. Um, I, I believe it was April 9th, this past April 9th. And so I'm on the far right and then Audrey and then her parents and then Doug and Curtis and Deanne. And normally on Sundays... Here's what happens. We, you know, by the time I'm done with the 8 o'clock service, the 9.30 service, the 11 o'clock service, and, and then wrapping up things, we go home, I grab something to eat, and I collapse. I'm old, you know. <laughs> I think that an afternoon siesta, you know. I, I sit there, you know, until I can no longer say any further conversation, and everybody kind of drifts away, and I'm, you know, gasping for air, you know. I went home on this day. It happened to be my birthday. And so I, I go home and I get there. Deanne was there because <clears throat> sometimes when, you know, when she has to work on the schedules that, that they often have on a Saturday, Sunday, Monday or something like that, and they work from 6 at night to 6.30 in the morning, they come and to be in the service, it doesn't work out so well. So she was at our house. Curtis had come so he could do his ministry here, and she was at the house sleeping. So she could catch a nap before she had to go back to work that night. So I get home after the service, and, I, and I'm kind of sitting there for a second. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, dum, 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 And she's up, and she's getting ready. I said, where is everybody? She said, oh, you don't know? I said, no, what? Oh, Grandma and Grandpa wanted to take us out to Outback to celebrate your birthday. I said, it'd be nice for somebody to let me know. Yeah, if I'm supposed to be, it's my birthday. <laughs> when was I going to find out? I'm the last to know. In, in our family, we always say the statement now, when, when if somebody hasn't found out, oh, I'm always the last to know. I'm always the last to know. So when Deanne or Doug are going to send us a, uh, let us know about something now, they'll text both of us at the same time. <laughs> or we'll text both of them at the same time because you don't want anybody to be the last to know. You know, and I got to the restaurant, and I said, hey, are, you, are we celebrating something? You didn't want me here? 
So we just have we just have a good time. But there are times some people can get upset about those kind of things, and they, you know, it's, they didn't they didn't sit around thinking they were busy and we're going and we're in one direction and everybody thought I was been told and I got home. <laughs> so there are times that things can be misunderstood. Let me take you to the globe for a second and look at the cities again that the Apostle Paul is ministering uh, in that area in Acts chapter 21. He starts out, look at the map at Miletus. And from Miletus, where he's ministering to the Ephesus uh, elders, he leaves there, goes straight to Kos, then to Rhodes, then to Patera. And then, well, let me just have it paint on the screen so you know. He goes from Patera to south of Cyprus to Tyre, to Pothomenus, to Caesarea, and then to Jerusalem. When he was in Tyre, just go up from Jerusalem, Caesarea, Pothomenus, Tyre. When he was in Tyre, here's what the text says in Acts 21, verse 4. And after looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days. Now, there are three things I want you to catch in this text for a moment, okay? Just in this one verse. He's in Tyre, seven days. And here's what the text says. And they kept telling Paul. Greek word there is elegon. Let me put it on the screen. It looks like this. And it happens to be uh, a verb. It's an indicative, perfect, active tense in the Greek, which means that they kept saying and kept saying and kept saying. Hey, by the way, have I told you? And they, but did I mention? And they just kept saying it. How many days were they there? Seven days. If you keep saying something for seven days, people get the idea, I got it. I got it. Hey, okay, enough. What's interesting about this Greek word is it's the same Greek word that is used when Paul has his thorn in the flesh. And he says, I asked the Lord and I kept asking the Lord to take it away. Remember that text? And he said, oh, my grace is sufficient. But he kept asking the Lord and kept asking the Lord. He said, three times I asked the Lord to take it from me. What's interesting is multiple times the Lord told him not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul didn't listen. And then Paul comes back and says, hey, Lord, how about if I ask you multiple times? The Lord says, you know, my grace is sufficient. Same Greek word, though. Look at he kept. They kept telling Paul. Secondly, they kept telling Paul through the Spirit. It wasn't there just their harebrained idea. The Holy Spirit was saying to them, to the church there, tell him what? Thirdly, not to set foot in Jerusalem. Is that pretty clear? So I, you know, we said this last week that I believe the Apostle Paul was not obedient to what the Lord was asking him to do. What did the Lord say? Through the church there? Now let me, let me just put this thought in your thinking because we're going to come back to this idea. Here's the church entire telling them through the Spirit multiple times, multiple times, and multiple times not to go. Later on, he's going to listen to another church in a different way. But let's talk about that later, okay? What I want you to see is, don't you think there were times Paul felt misunderstood by others? He's there seven days. And what did they keep telling him? Don't go to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit said, don't go there. The Holy Spirit says, don't go there. Hey, have I mentioned the Holy Spirit said, don't go there? Do you think that Paul felt a little misunderstood? He says, look, I believe the Lord's leading me there. So I I'm, I'm imagine he feels a little bit under, misunderstood. And so I would say this is the sermon in a sentence here. You can't go through life without being misunderstood by somebody. It's going to happen. If you're a parent, you're going to be misunderstood. You know, uh, your kids are out on, on some little league team or something, and you're just trying to help your kids. And you're just trying to defend your kids to some other parent. And that other parent thinks you're just pushing your kid. Or you're the coach of the team and you're trying to play everybody. I'll bet, I'll bet uh, some of you who have been soccer coaches have found that you, no matter what you do, it's not the best. You're trying to play everybody and you're trying to do what's good, but you're misunderstood. Let me say it this way. Paul was misunderstood three times in this particular text. Let me tell you the three ways Paul was misunderstood. We won't get them all today, but let's 
talk about them. First of all, Paul was a Christian, and he was misunderstood by the church. Secondly, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Hebrew is uh, the name for Jewish people, but he was the highest standing. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. So Paul was a Hebrew, and yet the Jewish people misunderstood him. So here he is a Christian, and the church should think they ought to understand him. And here he is a, a Hebrew, a Jewish person, and the Jews didn't understand him. He operated in kind of three dimensions. Christian, Jewish man, but thirdly, he was a Roman citizen, and yet the Roman captain misunderstood him at the end of this chapter. This chapter goes all the way to verse 40, and we're starting about verse 17, so that gives you some background. But let's just look at the first one. He was a Christian, yet the church misunderstood him. He got back to Rome, or back to Jerusalem, rather. And when he was in Jerusalem, here's this church made up of Jewish believers, and they said, wait a minute, Paul. Well, let's read the text. Starting at verse 17 of chapter 21. When we arrived at Jerusalem... Remember I said to you, every time you see we in this text, it's the writer who's Luke. He didn't say, well, Paul, when, when Paul got back to Jerusalem, right now, Luke is there with him. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. Hey, it's so good to have you here. Paul had grown up there. Paul was a part of that ministry. He'd grown up under Gamaliel. And one of the major reasons they were glad that they were back is, do you remember that the Jerusalem church was poor? And the reason they were poor is because as these Jewish people who lived in Israel started trusting Christ and stopped following all the Jewish ways, they were worshiping now Jesus, the Messiah. The other Jewish people that didn't believe in Jesus as God said, don't buy from them. They don't buy their products. They're not with us anymore. And so they had less and less money to get by on. And so that's why Paul took an offering from all the churches at Corinth and, and Berea and Thessalonica and Philippi and Troy. He just took an offering and said, I'm going to take us back to the church in Jerusalem. When he got back to the church in Jerusalem, he said, hey, I've got an offering for you. Oh, hey, good to see you, brother. Glad you're here. Where's the offering? <laughs> they had a good reason that he wanted to help them. But this is day one. And their first meeting. Look at what it says after that. Then the next day, okay? First day, warmly received. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem at that time. And all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And I emphasize on the screen what God had done. It's what we do in our church when we bring missionaries back. Tell us what God has done. Here's what God's done in our midst. That's why we have missionaries share so often here because part of the worship service is just what's going on right here. He came back and said, here's what God has done. But he goes on. When they heard this, they praised God. And that's a part of this worship service too. So that when you hear what a missionary has done and what God has done through that missionary, you go, oh, praise God. And what's the purpose of our church? To praise and glorify God. We keep saying that to you. The purpose of this church is to praise and glorify God. Not a social function. Not, we can do social things, but the purpose of this church is to praise and glorify God. So when Paul came back, what did they do? Praise God. Oh, that's wonderful. God, oh, God did that. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law. Man, it doesn't take long to go from praising God to being zealous for the law. Let's talk about the law. Let's talk about rules here. Because they had heard that Paul wasn't keeping the law. Verse 21, they had been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. 
You know what's amazing to this? When I look at this, there are many times that people say to you, have you heard about so-and-so? I just wanted you to be informed. And before you know it, people are hurt. People are getting in trouble. I just wanted to inform you that this was going on. You know, I don't know if you want your kids there. I just wanted to let you know. They've been informed. What shall we do? These people in Jerusalem will certainly hear that you are back in Jerusalem. They will certainly hear that you have come, so do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Here's the church leaders in Jerusalem saying to Paul, here's what we want you to do. Take these four guys, and we want you to pay for their sacrifices, and, and they can't afford things, and, and I want you to go up and do the same purification rites that they're doing so that everybody will know that you, what they've heard about you isn't true that you really do keep the law. So here's how it's worded. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. You're saying, what? What's that have to do with us today? Not much, but uh, the idea that they were going to keep this Nazarite vow. And they were going to make that, that was an important part of that Jewish because what will others think if you don't do this? You've seen that happen in churches. Well, what will other people think? Uh, just do this. Uh, you know, I know you don't feel comfortable. Just do it anyway, just for show. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everybody will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. He wasn't against the law. Now let me go on with the text. <clears throat> Verse 25. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decisions that they should abstain from food, sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat strangled of, animals, uh, of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. The next day, Paul took the men and did what the church asked him to do. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. By the way, just so you know, they weren't purified at that moment. It was a seven-day process. He started the process. Okay? Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and they seized him. Okay, the question I have for you is this. Was Paul really against the law? Absolutely not. But they thought he was, and they spread the word that he was. But there were some specific things that he said about the law, but he wasn't against the law. In Romans 7, 7, he says this about the law. What shall I say then? Is the law sin? Oh, certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except uh, through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. So the, the law is good. It just keeps telling me how to live. But the, the verse I like best about the law is 1 Timothy 1.8 where Paul says this. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Why is the law good if one uses it properly? Because the purpose of the law is not to get you to heaven. If the law could get you to heaven, then Jesus would, have had, would not have had to come and die for us on the cross. If keeping the law could get us there, if it were possible for us to keep the law, then Jesus wouldn't have had to come. So the law was like a tutor. That's what he uses in Galatians. Like a, like a schoolmaster. And the schoolmaster keeps at your kids and points them in the right direction. And the law comes along and says, don't covet. And you go, oh, I wish I had that. I can't believe they got it. And you start to covet what somebody else has. 
or you start to break the law. And so what the law, the purpose of the law, if we're going to use it properly, the law is just there to keep driving us to say, I can't do this. I keep making mistakes. I keep sinning. I can't, I can't live a perfect life. And if it's used for that purpose, then it drives us to Christ who is perfect and who can pay for all our sins. But see, when Paul came along, they were using this law not in the proper way. They were telling people they had to be circumcised in order to go to heaven. They had to do this in order to go to heaven. They had to do that. They had to make that sacrifice. And people began to think the law was the means to get them to heaven. And it doesn't. That's why the difference in sometimes in churches, when they start to focus on the law, they say, well, you, you go to heaven, you have to trust Christ, but then you have to keep all the laws. Look, you're never going to be able to keep all the laws. And Jesus said, I died for every one of your sins. Not for your sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. See, if being good could get you to heaven, then nobody's going to make it because uh, being perfect is what God asks. And so if you sin and God doesn't have sin in heaven, then where do you go with it? How many sins do you have to commit before you're a sinner? One. How many times do you have to rob a bank for your bank robber? One. How many times do you have to murder before you're a murderer? One. So the, the one thing that's wonderful about God is the ground is level at the cross. So that whether you've only committed one sin in your life or whether you're the mass murderer like son of Sam who killed many people in New York State in years past, he can go to heaven by repenting of his sins and trusting Christ and you can go to heaven by repenting of your one sin and trusting Christ. Because James 2.10 says, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of breaking the law. Is a sinner. How many sins do you have to sin before you're a sinner? One. And so the Lord comes along and he says, let's use the law properly. The purpose of the law was to show you that you aren't any... I know some, if I say it this way, somebody's going to react, that you aren't any good. <laughs> Paul said it this way, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth what? No good thing. Because my flesh wants to do sin. Does that mean I can't do some good things? Uh, that's not what Scripture is saying. It's, uh, we can do good things. You can help poor people and you can help it. But that doesn't get you saved. And so he says it this way in Romans 3.28. Paul writing, For we maintain that a man is justified, is saved by faith, apart from observing the law. So how do you get to, get to heaven? It's apart from the law. It's not by the law, but it's separate from the law. He says it this way also in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. No one will ever be saved. So the people are hearing this. The people in Jerusalem have heard what he's written. And he's written this. This is one of the first books that's written in the New Testament, the book of Galatians, written early on, about 50 AD. And the word's getting out there. Paul's written this. You read what he wrote in, in Romans 3, 28. It's not through the law. It's not through the law here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, he says it this way. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. So, Paul gets to Jerusalem and they say, wait a minute. What are you telling people? Let's have you do this. Take these four guys and take them up and, and do some of the law so that people will say, oh, see, Paul's not against the law. But you know what's amazing? F.F., uh, oh no, um, Warren Wiersbe in his book says this, it seems incredible that Paul's enemies would accuse him of these things for all the evidence was against them. 
Paul had Timothy circumcised before taking him along on the second missionary journey. Paul had taken a Jewish vow while in Corinth, and it was his custom not to offend the Jews in any way by deliberately violating their customs, customs or the law of Moses. And he quotes 1 Corinthians 9 where Paul says, you know, I, I, I'm all things to all men. To the Jew, I became like a Jew. To one without the law, I became like one without the law so that I could win them over to Christ. But wait a minute, how far do you go there? To the Jew, I became a Jew so that I could win the Jew. To the, this person, I became like this person so that I could win them. So do I say, okay, I want to win my, my alcoholic drunken buddy to Jesus. So I say to him, hey, let's go out and have a few beers and let's you know, tie one on and let's... And I start saying to him, oh, now don't you think it's about time to trust Jesus? You know, and I, I, I don't become a drunk so I can win a drunk because now I'm violating scripture. But where Paul could give way, he gave way. So to the Jewish person, I became like a Jewish person. And, and we do this all the time with people. We say, oh, who's your favorite football team? And, and we start identifying with them so we can share the Lord with them. Or we talk about, salespeople do this all the time. And so Paul came in, but did he violate the law? No, they said, well, you don't practice circumcision. Well, he had Timothy circumcised. So that he wouldn't be offensive. But he didn't tell Timothy, that's going to get you to heaven. Because circumcision doesn't get anybody to heaven. I don't think God's going to check you out on the way into heaven and say, let's see, are you circumcised? <laughs> I better leave that one alone. I'm not going any further. <clears throat> but now let's deal with the real problem in this text. The real problem is this. I told you that I believe that the Apostle Paul was disobedient to the Lord in going to Jerusalem. I told you entire. They kept telling and kept telling and kept telling through the Spirit not to go where? Jerusalem. That's early in the chapter. Now, but let me say it this way. The issue of whether you believe Paul was right or wrong in going to Jerusalem pales in comparison to the confusion he would create if he was allowed to follow through on what the leaders of the Jerusalem church had proposed. You know, the fact that if he was in Jerusalem and he wasn't supposed to be there, he was out of God's will. But I'm telling you that even that pales in comparison to what the church is asking him to do there. Let me show it to you again. They had been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men. Join in their purification rites and pay their expenses. Uh, by the way, can I just emphasize, it's their purification rites. They're sinners before God and they need to have this sin dealt with. They need to be purified before God in these purification rites. Join in, join in their purification rites and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everybody will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself, you yourself are living in obedience to God. As for the Gentiles, we've already told you about that. We've written them. We've dealt with that in Acts 15 is what he's saying to them. He goes on in verse 26. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. Can I emphasize that? The offering would be made for each of them. Now, this is not the same word when I say at the end of the service, I'm going to ask the ushers to come as we take the offering, as we give to God. That's an offering of money. Only one translation, I think it was the, uh, the New American Standard, um, uses the word that is here. They, they usually call it an offering because in the Old Testament, it was an offering, and the offering always consisted of a sacrifice. So the, uh, the New American Standard says there, uh, 
well, uh, then, then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the sacrifice would be made for them. The sacrifice would be made for them. Let me show you what F.F. Uh, F. Bruce says ab about this. F.F. F. Bruce points out that the offering consisted of one he lamb, one ewe lamb, and one ram. Okay, when you're taking animals into the temple to make a sacrifice, all of a sudden you're talking about blood sacrifices here. And why did they offer blood sacrifices? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, no forgiveness of sins. So in the Old Testament, from the time Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what did God do? He took an animal, sacrificed it, took the skins of the animal and covered up Adam and Eve with the skins of the animal. And it was a sacrifice to deal with their sin. An animal sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 10 and 11 says this, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But the text goes on, day after day, every priest in the Old Testament stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But with Jesus, he died once for all. Hebrews 9, 12 says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So now they're asking Paul to go in and do what? Make a sacrifice. But wait a minute. Jesus has done it, what? Once for all. And now Paul comes back in and he's there with the Jewish believers in Jerusalem and they're saying, here's what we want you to do. James Boyce says it this way. The same apostle who had written so many New Testament books, the man who had argued so forcibly that we are saved by Jesus Christ alone was about to go into the Jewish temple and in the presence of the very priests who had crucified the Lord, there participate with others in a sacrifice of an animal that was meant to be an atonement for his sin. That is, Paul was about to turn his back on the only sufficient sacrifice of Christ. Do you understand why Paul got misunderstood? Let's keep in mind, if he hadn't gone, if, he, if he'd obeyed the Lord and hadn't gone to Jerusalem, at least from what we gather in verse 4, he wouldn't even be in this traffic jam. He wouldn't even be in this position of compromise. But now he's there and they're asking him to make a sacrifice so that the people are going, wait a minute, Romans you said keeping the law wouldn't do this. Galatians you said it wouldn't do this. Why are you doing this? Let me give you another statement by Boyce uh, in, in his commentary on Acts. To go through some system of purification is a virtual repudiation of Christ's completed work. Let me give you the flip side of this. There are commentaries that say this is a wonderful thing. What Paul did was a wonderful thing. This is the New International Version uh, uh, application commentary of Acts by Fernando. He says, we may sometimes agree to do things we feel are unnecessary for us personally, but help maintain unity. There are people that come to our church and they say, you know, I... I really don't like the drums up there, but I, but I, I listen to them. <laughs> Nothing against you, Corrado, you know. I, but they don't like the drums, and they just want a hymn, but they sacrifice for the sake of what? Unity. Unity. So what he's saying now is the Apostle Paul was going to do this sacrifice of the lambs and the rams for the sake of unity. So read it here with me. We may sometimes agree to do things we feel are unnecessary uh, for us personally to help maintain unity. 
Paul did this in his involvement with the four men who took a vow. He bent over backwards and submitted to the will of the body, the church there, in keeping with what he taught in Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, wait a minute. Remember what I told you to begin with? At the church in Tyre, they kept telling him, how many days? Seven days, they kept telling him and kept telling him and kept telling him and kept telling him. Through the Spirit, through the Spirit, don't go, don't go there, don't go there. Why wouldn't he submit to them? But yet he turns right around in Jerusalem and submits to making a sacrifice for his purification before them. Do you understand why people are a little confused on the Apostle Paul? And he gets misunderstood by the church. I would say that many times we get misunderstood by people because we've got ourselves into that problem. He goes on further. Fernando, uh, Fernando says in his new uh, International Version commentary, the request of the Jerusalem Christians for Paul to be involved in the funding of the vows of four brothers is another good example of fallible Christians trying to express Christian love. We cannot be certain whether this act was a mistake. But it shows us how serious Paul was about preserving unity in the body of Christ. He was willing to do anything almost. He says everything there. Everything possible <clears throat> to please Christians who were different from him. Come on. What does he say? We cannot be certain whether this act was a mistake. If I ask you to make a sacrifice today of an animal for the purification of your lives, what would you say? Christ has already done it. Now, if this is just a vow and he's making a vow and this is an offering to complete a vow, you still don't want to confuse people. Christ has already purified you. And if we sin, what does he say? If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's no sacrifice that you make. Christ died once for all, and that's what's so wonderful about it. And once you repent of your sins and trust Christ, he said, I'll, I'll transform your life. I'll save you. The writer that I, of what I just read forgets that Paul was willing to offer a blood sacrifice that would in essence say Christ's sacrifice was not sufficient. But Christ's sacrifice was sufficient. So when we get to this, what's wonderful is that sometimes when you look at are you causing others to misunderstand you? If Paul hadn't gone to Jerusalem, again, he wouldn't even be in this position to compromise. Now he's there and they want him to do things that he's already said won't save anybody. And the next time we look at this, we'll be in about three weeks and we'll come back and do some follow-up on what God did in the process with Paul as he got entangled in this. Can I invite you to pray with me? Heavenly Father, there are times that we're misunderstood. We're praying that you would put a guard on our hearts and our minds and our lips so that we won't wound people with our words. Father, I pray that we could learn from the Apostle Paul. Father, I thank you for his, his steadfastness in so many ways. Help us just to realize that we too can go places be put in uh, situations where we again compromise. Thank you, Lord, 
that when I think about every Christian church out there from the time of the first century on, no longer makes a sacrifice of an animal and sheds their blood so that we could have forgiveness. We thank you that you were sufficient. We want to live in a way that would honor you and be obedient to you now. In Christ's name, amen.